Because you're ready to go. Unless you had, you know, unless you, you know, you had the, the one, you know, you know, you were doing strange things, <laughs> cooking or something, making the alarm go off. <laughs> Yeah, it was slippery. No question about that. It was unusual. Okay, well, maybe there's going to be more than just one person online today, it looks like. We'll see. So they can watch it as you're doing this at home? Or is it? Uh, you could actually watch it streamed. Yes, it is streamed. So you could actually watch it live. Wow. And as long as you pick it up from 12.15 to 1.30. And then on the next day, then it's available for, it's available for uh, in a kind of a downloadable version. So it actually, I think they cut some of the frames out, but it, it looks as though it's live. Oh, okay. Uh, so it actually is not bad. Yeah. Uh, and then the notes are there. Looks like I might try to fill in more pages of notes because it does. It, they get four pages of these things on, so it's actually only three screens, or so. And then you get the full PDF file. Uh, uh, looks like I could fill in more notes, and it looks like I could go a little faster too. Um, so in fact, I think I'm going to change. The homework three. I don't know if anybody has looked at it yet, but I'm going to change homework three. I think I'm going to take uh, homework three. I think I had 2.8. Number eight is kind of a. I'm going to kill that problem, and I'm going to add 2.9 numbers uh, four and six. So I'll put that on the website. Change you made to website. Uh, I will make, I'll change, make change to website. Because, um, delete. This one. Um, it looks like we'll be able to do three sections a day, three sections a week. I mean, I didn't want to rush it too much, but uh, I'm getting the feeling that we may be able to handle a little bit more. This is a pretty good class, and I didn't want it to be a repeat of your linear algebra class. How many people have taken the uh, linear algebra, Chakravarti's class? And how much has been reviewed so far? Oh. Almost all of it. So that's the sense that I got that you've already had this material to a large degree. You may have actually had didn't do the Bonox spaces. We didn't do the Bonox spaces. But metric space you did too? That was analysis too. That was an analysis too. So you've had all this stuff, even all the theorems so far in this chapter too, you've had? Actually, my impression of the chapters, they were very sketchy, very light. It seemed like the uh, linear algebra book and the analysis two book covered the subjects more completely as far as that. So I, I then, yeah, then, then what's in our book right now? Then what's in your so book I right now? I think that we covered the majority of the terms. In chapter two? Um, yeah, at least as much as I read. Yeah, what, about, yeah. what about Hilbert spaces? Did you cover that in linear algebra as well? No. no, no. Pretty much didn't touch hardly any infinite dimensional yeah. spaces. Oh, no, yeah. infinite dimensional spaces. So like all the following spaces and all that. Okay. So a number of the examples in Chapter 2, that's good. Well, it's good that it's reviewed. So I'm going to speed it up just a little bit in Chapter 2. I think I'm going to, instead of running only two sections for the third week, I'm going to go to a third section for that week. So 2, 7, 2, 8, and 2, 9. And I've subtracted one of the problems that I thought was kind of innocuous anyway and added a couple other ones. And that's really math 313, those problems that I've added. So that's still more review, but I wanted to make sure we, we don't just slow down too much here because it is a lot of review. But it's good review. And I think by studying it well, you will actually uh, integrate the material a lot better. So I think it's a, an excellent review. 
And then we'll have a little bit more time, perhaps, in the end for uh, some spectral theory or what have you, and see maybe people will be able to go on themselves to the chapters 10 and 11, the uh, quantum physics applications, the, the intro to the quantum physics, so to see what's in there. So perhaps if, if people want to do a project or something, that's always on the side, perhaps. Uh, I haven't planned to do individual projects, but the class is small enough that we could. So I have a th thought about that. If, if you'd rather do that, uh, perhaps as, as part of a, a process, I'd be uh, willing to entertain that. I, I just hadn't, because this is my first time teaching the course. <laughs> we have to think a little quicker, you know, at the beginning. Okay. So uh, this week, homework one's going to be due. Usually on Tuesday before the homework is due, I'll ask for any questions and see if I can uh, provide any hints for things that are really sticking people. Any questions so far about homework one? Yeah, I think I have one. Uh, a quick. Okay. Tuesday, right? Yes, it is. Oh, okay, because I think you just said Tuesday. Oh, yeah, Tuesday I'll answer questions. Oh, okay, I thought you said it was due Tuesday, so I said it's due today. <laughs> no, 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 it's not due today. So if you didn't start it yet, you're still okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's see if I, I thought I had something that was related at least. I'm not sure if we covered it last time. Oh yeah, exercises 2.3.1 and 2.3.2. Maybe I should go there. Just to, this will be a little bit of a uh, backdrop for some of your exercises in 2.3. I think those are the only ones that are going to give you trouble. There was a problem 2.3. Um, point well, there's actually 2.3.3 and 2.3.9, and then the associated problem 2.3.7, which is an extra credit problem, which could give you some trouble, but uh, 2.3.1 and 2.3.2, let's reviewing those exercises. Um, notice that in the notation he uses a dash for the actual section of the book, so I'm going to denote exercises if otherwise by this the, the double dot notation. This is the section out of the book, this is the exercise number. This is the section out of the book, this is the exercise number. Okay, as opposed to the dash notation, which 2.3 dash 1 is the first paragraph of section 2.3. Okay. So here's, what's the problem 2.3.1, 2.3.2? The problem simply. Were those signs? No. Okay. No. I want to do these in the examples in the notes. If, if you're reading the type notes there, uh -oh. it's the uh, third page of notes two. Uh, excuse me, of notes one. I think we're still in notes one there. Third page of notes one of typed notes one. Anybody reading those so far or having a look at them at all? Where did you get them? Are they? They're on the, uh, online. Oh, okay. <coughs> Oh, the notes. Um, I've the note. The type notes. Yeah. Okay. So they exist. So look on the look on the website. Um, it says show that that the sequence space C in L infinity is a vector subspace of L infinity, and so is C the space of all sequences of scalars converging to zero. So I want to consider C naught. I'm, I'm going to skip that part. It's relatively simple to show that it's a vector space. Basically, if you have a sequence, let's just take C naught. C naught equals sequences converging to zero. 
Obviously, that's an L infinity. In other words, it's a bounded sequence. A convergent sequence is a bounded sequence. And if you add two sequences that are converging to zero, the sum still converges to zero. If you scale a multiply sequence converging to zero, it still converges to zero. Therefore, C0 is a vector subspace of L infinity. Okay. And problem two then. So problem one is covered. All right. Check. Okay, <laughs> covered 2.3.1. Kind of, sometimes the exercises are relatively simple, especially these early ones. But that's good. C0 in problem one is a closed subspace of L infinity, so that C0 is complete. Okay, one of the theorems um, that um, we have is. Um, Theorem 1.4-7, that in a metric space, uh, that if you have a subset of a complete metric space, that it is self complete if and only if it's closed. So let me write that down. Theorem 1.4-7. If X is a complete metric space, then a subset M in X is complete if and only if M is closed in X. Or just plain closed. Okay? And we did go over what closed was. It contained, uh, the, the set contains its limit points, or it's equal to its closure, right? M closed, recall, M closed. If and only if M contains all its limit points. Okay. So what we want to do here is basically what we're, what we're hunting is we want to show that C0 is closed in L infinity. So I'm going to write up here to show C0 is closed in L infinity. L infinity is itself a complete metric space. It's a Bonnock space we mentioned. We didn't go uh, line by line through the proof of completeness. That's in chapter one. But let's assume that now and show that C0 is itself a closed subspace. Seems reasonable. We'll cover the, the, the uh, definitions that way at least. Yes, sir, Matt. Okay, um, would you just take any sequence from C0? Um, and you're basically for every convergent sequence, remember just the point in space, right? Uh, Proof closed. Okay, let's we'll go ahead. Go ahead and let's go ahead with the definition then. Let's just go see how would we prove closed. To show C0 is closed in L infinity, what will you do now? Um, let's just show that any convergent sequence converges to a point within the space. Mm -hmm. So let's take a convergent sequence of sequences, right? So, yeah, so here's, here's how it goes. Let xn be a convergent sequence of elements in L infinity with xn in C0 for every n and call 
the limit uh, of the sequence xn by x in L infinity. Okay, so there's going to be some limit. I need to show that x is actually in C0. In other words, what I've done is I've taken an element x in C0 closure. I need to show that x is in C0. In other words, let x be in C0 bar, okay, that's the bar on top, the closure, that's the closure of C0, uh, so that there is some sequence xn in C0 with xn going to x, okay? If you take something in the closure, then that will automatically happen. And then need to show then to show x is in C0. So I've just repeated myself. I just want to point out the technique to showing something is closed. Yeah, I'm, so I've repeated myself. <laughs> okay. Everybody clear? All right, now how are you going to do it? Well, one way is to set up a notation. So I'm going to ask, then I'll ask for some more input from, from you. Um, let's write xn itself is a sequence, right? It's an element of C0, so I have to write it as a sequence. Uh, C1 super n, C2 super n, C3 super n, etc. It's a sequence that converges to zero. Where we know. So I'm going to use the subscript limit j goes to infinity c sub j super n equals zero for every n. Because right? they're all elements of all the xn's are elements of c0. So what should we do next? I need to show that x itself is a sequence that converges to zero. So write x, it's an element of L infinity. Write x equals c1, c2, etc. And then so it boils down to show, need to show that limit c sub j equals to zero j goes to infinity. So it looks like we have the thing pretty well cornered in terms of what we need to show. Now what we get to use is, what do we get to use? We get to use that xn is going to x in the L infinity norm. We know Lim norm xn minus x infinity equals to zero as n goes to infinity. <clears throat> so we have the infinity norm is, is the maximum. Right? If, if you think of the infinity norm as the maximum and the difference of the coordinates is going to zero. Okay, so we're, how can we finish it now?
Okay, well, I'll just go ahead. <laughs> Let epsilon be greater than zero. Okay. Let epsilon be greater than zero. Because I want to show, I need to, where well, we know this, I need, need to show this. Right? So in order to show something has a limit equal to zero, I'm going to let epsilon be greater than zero. I need to find a capital J so large. There's two indices here, but I need the capital J so large that if little j is greater than or equal to capital J, then Cj in absolute value is less than minus zero, is less than epsilon. That's the definition of the limit of a sequence. So just writing everything down may be a little bit helpful. I need to find the capital J. Now, how can I get that one? Well, I think I, I need to use somehow the cap. I need to use this limit here. So I need to use that there's a capital N. All right? I know there exists a capital N. I know there exists, and I better, maybe I need to use epsilon over 2 for that part. I know there exists a capital N so large that, uh, let's say, x sub capital N minus x in the infinity norm is less than epsilon over 2. Now, maybe that's going to help. What am I going to use here? That means that the two sequences, x sub capital N and x, the two sequences, um, their infinity norm is less than epsilon over 2. That means they're very close. So let's draw a picture. Let's draw a picture. Let's see. What I need to show is this. I think there might be just enough room for a picture in here. Um, I have J, okay. Xn is converging to Z, capital X sub n. If I draw a picture, what is that? Ah, <laughs> oh, here it is. Um, X sub n already converges to zero, so if I consider the sequence X sub n, all right, that's a, that's a graph of a function. Only it's, it's points, right? So I'm going to draw a sequence, um, and it's converging to zero. Let's just pretend it's a positive. Okay. And now I have the graph of x. All I know is that it's that it's within the epsilon over two tube of that one. So if I draw a little tube around this graph of thickness epsilon in the vertical direction, then x is in there. All right. So. So this is this is this width that actually is epsilon because half the tube width is epsilon over two. So so that means well it looks like x should be going to zero too, right? Or let's hope so anyway. All right, this is true for every capital for every epsilon. There's a capital n. All right, so how can I get that? What I'm going to do is I have this. What does this condition imply? X sub capital N minus X less than epsilon over 2. What does it imply? It implies that, in fact, that the supremum of Cj super N minus Cj over all J greater than or equal to 1 is less than epsilon over 2. That means, in particular, that, um, that I have control over... Um, all the CJs in terms of CJ super N, all right? So here's what I'm going to write then. I'm going to write CJ. Here's what I'm going to write. I know that CJ super N 
goes to zero. I need the other epsilon over two. Cj super n goes to epsilon goes to zero as j goes to infinity. Okay. Therefore, there exists a capital J for that fixed n. So capital N is fixed. There's just n fix it now. Okay. Fix it. There exists a capital N. Sub epsilon, of course. Epsilon is fixed. Now that capital N is fixed. And now I choose there exists a capital J for that fixed capital N. You could put it J sub capital N sub epsilon if you want. Okay? I'll just write that, you know, J sub capital N sub epsilon. I mean, it depends on those other two things that are already fixed. So that um, CJ super N, capital N, is less than epsilon over 2 if little j is greater than or equal to capital J. That's the definition of the limit equal to 0 again. We know that there's a particular sequence, the one that I drew here, is going to zero. This is the C sub this is the little C sub J of N equals C sub J super N here. <clears throat> okay. That's what I've graphed there as a function of J. That's going to zero. So you have that, that's small. So that's small, the tube size is small. Therefore, to add the two epsilon over twos together, and you get that, that um, the following. Therefore, Cj, okay, which is the jth element of x, the limit of the sequence in L infinity. Remember what x was? X was the limit, which was in the um, C0 bar. Okay, I chose an element X in C0 bar. <clears throat> okay, I think that's just a little bit higher up on these scales here. I let I let X in C0 bar. Here it was. Let X in C0 bar. And I need to show that x is in C0. I wrote x equal to C1, C2, and so on. Okay. I need to show that limit Cj is equal to 0. This is what I need to show here. So that's what I want to do now. I want to just show that there's a capital J. I claim this capital J works. Cj is equal to, the, uh, or less than or equal to, Cj super n minus Cj plus, um, well, maybe I should write the other way, plus Cj super n. I'm using the triangle inequality. I'm writing Cj equals Cj minus Cj super n plus Cj super n. And then using the triangle inequality. Okay. One of these was small because the supremum overall J was less than epsilon over 2. So in particular, uh, that's less than epsilon over 2. And this one was small because the sequence CJ super N went to 0. So one is because of the tube, and the other one is because already the point was close to 0. Okay. And so I get less than epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2 equals epsilon. And that's what I wanted to show. Okay. So it's not bad, but you just have to put all your tinker toys together, <laughs> you know. It is kind of a uh, messy. All right. Uh, therefore, limit CJ equals to zero, so x is in C0. Okay. 
right like that. Okay. So what's the corollary? The corollary is that C0 is itself a Banach space. Since uh, it is a closed subspace of a Banach space. Okay. We said that the closed subset of a complete metric space, which a Banach space is a, a Banach space is a complete metric space, the the, uh, the subspace will be complete if and only if it's closed. And so we have indeed showed that this is closed. Now can you think of a, uh, a, a, a subspace that isn't closed in the infinite dimensional case? We're going to have one in a little while. Maybe I should just do it now. Maybe I should just do it now since we're in this business. Okay. It turns out that any finite dimensional subspace will automatically be closed. All right, that's one of our terms today. But what about infinite dimensional subspace? I'll just do the example out of order here. Okay. So let's go to the next page. Um, example of an infinite dimensional subspace of a known Banach space that is not closed. And if you think about it, it's not very far from what you were already talking about today. Somebody mentioned an, an infinite dimensional space over here this morning. I'm talking about that linear algebra discussion. Polynomials. Very good. That's the example. Polynomials as a subspace of C01. So let's take the C01 is a continuous function on the unit interval with the, with the max norm or the soup norm. Max norm. Whenever I say C01, that's what I mean. The max norm. Okay, so you can always have different norms on a on a given set of functions. So we can talk about the unit interval as that and as a vector and put two different norms on, which we did. We had the one norm, the integral of the absolute value. And my, with, when the author mentions C01, he means automatically this unless otherwise stated. It's always the, the max norm uh, as the default. So if there's no other comments, then that's the point. Okay. Now then we're going to take Z equal to polynomials. In T in the unit interval. Okay, the claim is that's not closed. That's a subspace, sum of two polynomials. It's a polynomial. These are finite polynomials. There is no infinite polynomial, okay? But that's going to be the counterexample, of course. We want to take the Taylor series of e to the t, say, well, that converges uniformly to e to the t by a resultant analysis, okay? And, uh, but e to the t is not a polynomial because you can differentiate it as many times as you want and it doesn't go away. <laughs> so that's the good example because all polynomials will go away. So e to the t is clearly not a polynomial. So everybody see it now? That's the quick example. Um, we have that... Uh, yeah. put, uh, let z of t equals e to the t 
zero less or equal to t less or equal to one. Z is in the C zero one. Okay. And put Z n equals Z n of t equals one plus t plus t squared over two factorial plus and so on plus t to the n over n factorial. That's polynomial. And what you get is that by previous knowledge, uh, study of uniform convergence, let's say in, in, in modern analysis too, Uh, z n minus z in this soup in this max norm goes to zero as n goes to infinity. So actually, what we're saying is that z n converges to z uniformly. Is how it's stated in in the modern analysis course because in modern analysis we don't introduce this norm per se. Uh, unless the instructor chooses to do so, but they talk about uniform convergence, which is exactly the same thing. Okay. So the max z and t minus z of t in absolute value is less than epsilon for all n greater than or equal to capital N. Okay. Uh, but so so z is in the closure. of the polynomials. I put the closure sign on it, but Z is not in Z. It's not a polynomial, as I mentioned, because you can differentiate it as many times as you want. E to the T, to no matter how many derivatives you take, equals e to the t. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. All right, then. So there do exist non-closed infinite dimensional subspaces. All right. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this little section on completeness for now. There is a way to take any um, normed vector space and complete it. There is a construction by which you actually uh, can turn it into a larger space that is complete. Basically add the points that you would need so that all Cauchy sequences would converge. We mentioned that we can easily make a non-complete space by taking a complete space and taking a point out. <laughs> okay. What you have to do in the completion process is have a general recipe for putting points, adding points in just enough. And that way you can actually uh, construct a complete space. But we're going to kind of skirt that issue. There's a general discussion in, in chapter one about the metric, just completion of metric spaces. And the same recipe will apply. But I, I did make some comments in the notes, but I'm going to skip it for now. Okay, we absolutely need it. Okay? All right. So let's go on for today. Um, I want to go back to vector spaces and finite dimensional vector spaces and norm spaces. I want to, what is done in sections 2.4 through 2.6 is get collect all the results for finite dimensional spaces, which are somewhat special. I think some of you, many of you, had all those results already in the linear algebra class, but we're going to collect them here and show the techniques, and that will bring back the you know compactness and so on which you probably didn't cover much in linear algebra, the compactness. So here we have uh, continuity of vector space operations. So I think, so just to highlight this a little bit, I think what I just mentioned was that in the, in the previous business was that uh, any finite dimensional subspace 
of a norm space would automatically be closed. So we don't have to be talking about a bonic space, we can just be talking about norm spaces. In this chapter, we're mostly going to be talking about, in this section, we're mostly going to just be talking about uh, finite dimensional norm spaces. And so I know I thought metric spaces, norm spaces, bonic spaces, is, you know, it's, you got to keep it straight a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be working with a normed space. And this is whether it's uh, finite or not. So <clears throat> what I have is let, this is 2.3.5. Actually, another exercise we skipped. Let x be a normed space. I've indicated the norm here, but that's always what the norm looks like, <laughs> so it's a little redundant. But what I'll do is assume xn goes to x and yn goes to y. So I'll assume I have two sequences, one sequence of elements or vectors converging to x, another sequence converging to y. And assume a sequence of scalars also. Assume also alpha n goes to alpha in the scalars, in scalar field. So these convergences are going on in x or in norm of the norm space, and this convergence alpha n going to alpha is in the norm of the uh, scalar field, which is absolute value. <laughs> okay. All right, then show that if I add, then this goes to x plus y. That's kind of obvious, but maybe we should just write it down what it means. Alpha n, xn goes to alpha x, and I'll call this a, b, and c. The norm of xn goes to the norm of x. So these are things we're going to use over and over and over again, so I, so I thought we might just at least write them down. And actually this last part C is what we call the continuity of the norm. These two are called the continuity of the vector space operations. This is called the continuity of the norm in case you run across it. Any uh, suggestions? How do I verify A? What's the definition of convergence? Is there an easy one? In a metric space, it's just take the distance, make the distance be going to zero, right? So, I just need the distance between these two sides going to zero. How would I do that? Prove A. Proof of A. I need the distance going to zero. So, I need... Uh, smaller than something that's going to zero. What's, uh, that's implicit use of the squeeze theorem. If I have, let's, should I put that on the side here? Do we know the squeeze theorem? Okay, I'll just use it then. If I, have, if I have two sequences both going to zero and I have a sequence of real numbers between those two sequences going to zero in the reals, then, it, then the, the middle sequence also goes to zero. So in my application, what I know is that this norm is always greater than or equal to zero. Right? So zero is my first sequence that's going to zero, a constant sequence. And then on the right side, what I want to do is just get uh, some sequence which is going to zero. So how can I get a sequence going to zero? Here. Triangle inequality, very good. So you have xn minus x plus yn minus y.
following up the thing, but that's that's what it is. Those by assumption are both sequences going to zero, therefore the sum goes to zero through non negative numbers, and therefore by the squeeze theorem we have the continuity of the first vector space operation, addition. Xn goes to zero and Yn goes to zero. Yn minus Y goes to zero by assumption. So by the squeeze theorem. xn plus yn minus x plus y goes to zero, which is what I need to show for a. A is so a is proved. Okay. Now I need to show b. That's only that's a little bit harder. But I don't know if you've ever. Uh, I need alpha n xn minus alpha x going to zero. So proof of B. I take that in the norm again. Now, where, you know, how could that be big? Suppose Xn is very, very close to X. That could be big because, uh, well, Because x might be something like 1. Think about it. Okay. And alpha n could be far from alpha. All right. That could, that could be a, a contribution, right? So basically, alpha n minus alpha times x. Or another possibility is that you had basically alpha times xn minus x. So it's the same thing you use to prove the product <laughs> rule. If you ever do the product rule in uh, calculus, kind of a decomposition. I'm going to write. I'm just going to use an identity. This is equal to alpha n times xn minus x plus alpha n minus alpha times x. Remember that kind of stuff? Yeah, that's all you have to do. Old trick. And Therefore, that's less than or equal to by the triangle inequality absolute value of alpha n times the norm xn minus x plus absolute alpha n minus alpha times the norm of x. Now, again, I can use a squeeze theorem, and this is actually not too bad because absolute alpha n is going to alpha, so the absolute value of alpha n goes to the absolute value of alpha. That's by a correspond, you know, by a, a result from real numbers, um, the absolute value is a continuous function. We already know that the norm is continuous on the real line. All right, the norm is the absolute value. Okay, that's already a continuous function. Okay, so this goes to the absolute value of alpha. This goes to zero by assumption. This goes to zero by assumption. This is constant. Therefore, this goes to absolute value of alpha times zero plus zero times absolute value of x, which is equal to the real number zero. And therefore, by the squeeze theorem, we know again that b is proved. Okay? Not again that b is proved, but we know now that b is proved by the same type of argument. Comments? How do we know when you use the squeeze theorem? We just yeah, that's from our analysis course. We can prove it right now if you want. Well, I mean, I know it works for, for you know, regular... Well, I'm using it as real numbers, because okay. this is a real number. Yeah. Remember, the norm is a real, uh, positive real number, okay, yeah. well, not a negative real number. So I'm using that this is... Remember that, that something converges in the infinite dimensional space. Yeah, this is, this is your polynomial, and that's your e to the t or whatever, okay? Sure, the vectors are in infinite dimensional space, but convergence by definition, is that the distance or the norm of the difference 
goes to zero. Now, so therefore I can convert my problem of convergence into just sequences of real numbers. And that's in fact how it's done. Okay. These were different sequences though, like an arbitrary type of space here. We well, okay, if it's in a me we're working always in a metric space at least. Right. So we didn't go beyond that case. We define metric space convergence is if the distance between x n and x goes to zero. That's then the question of does the real sequence converge to zero? So here so that's what I'm doing here. That's why all the norm signs. The norm means distance. So keep track of yeah, the things inside the norm are the infinite dimensional vectors, but when do they converge? Okay. Yeah. So here the infinite dimensionality kind of rears its head a little bit. But the norm is what's helping us. So it's actually very, it's just repeating the arguments that we had for the real line. If I needed to prove that I've had two sequences of real numbers, alpha n and x, and pretend alpha n and x n are sequences of real numbers, prove b for the real numbers. It's the same exact proof. Then you had to use in that proof, say that the first, that if you had just, uh, a uh, single sequence alpha and then the absolute value of alpha n goes to alpha. We're going to get that now in part C because we're going to do the same proof again. So actually, uh, part C for real numbers is used in part B here, okay, where we use this goes to alpha. All right? So let's, and then the proof is independent, okay, of course. So I don't need to use part B in order to get part C here. So let's see part C. How does that work? Is that answering your question, Travis? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's do part C. I need to show, uh, assume the norm of xn, excuse me, again, assume the um, xn, xn goes to x, i.e., that means that the norm of the difference goes to zero as n goes to infinity. Yeah. So, so that's if, if you were working with C01, for example, you have to be careful and to check that condition, all right, to really see if a sequence does go to zero. Because you can have a sequence of functions, continuous functions, um, that converges to some other continuous function point by point, but not in the norm. Do you all know such an example? Uh, a sequence of continuous functions that converges to another continuous function point-wise, but not uniformly. That's really not in the topic of discussion of this course because we're not discussing point-wise versus uniform convergence, but there certainly does exist. So you have to check. So you, this is really assuming the stronger convergence. We do have the uniform convergence. I think the example I'm thinking of is this one over here where I've got a little, um, this is just an aside here. So to answer your questions and hopefully fill in some of these um, questions, if I have this tent looking function here, okay, on the unit interval, where this is a, let's say, 2 over n and the peak occurs at 1 over n, this is something out of your old analysis course, and this height is 1. This is a continuous function, and if I let n go to infinity, it converges pointwise to the function that is everywhere 0, but does not converge uniformly to the function which is everywhere 0, because in fact the max between 0 and this function is clearly one constantly so that there was never uniform convergence so here's point wise converge so here's a good vector xn the good vector x which is the zero vector um, you think that xn goes to x but it doesn't so so this this is not holding this this condition does not hold in c01 xn does not go to zero this is xn xn does not go to zero in C01. Okay? Even though it's converging pointwise to the zero function. For each fixed t, xnt, while even though for every t, xnt goes to x of t uh, equal to zero. 
Okay. Okay. So that's your aside for the day. I don't know if that. Okay. So so we're assuming the norm convergence. So that's a strong condition if you think about it. A little bit. All right. Then um, to prove then that x n in norm converges to the norm of x. So that doesn't seem too bad. And actually, that goes pretty easily. Um, it follows simply by the reverse triangle inequality. Follows, again, by the squeeze theorem. Follows from norm of x n minus the norm of x is always less than or equal to an absolute value of the actual norm of the difference. Okay, that's called the reverse triangle inequality. And it follows from the proof of the triangle, it just pro follows not from the proof of the well, the triangle inequality is assumed to already have been checked in these spaces, right? So it actually follows just by writing out the triangle inequality and remanipulating it, okay? To put things on the other side, and this falls out. So that works now because I need to show norm of xn goes to the norm of x. Well, that's true if and only if this goes to this thing on the left side goes to zero. But I've already assumed this goes to zero. Therefore, again, by the squeeze theorem, the, the, the quantity and absolute values here does go to zero. So C follows by squeeze theorem again. All right. So there's the review of all these analysis topics <laughs> in a nutshell. And above tr reverse triangle inequality. Okay. All right, so that's that business. Now, I want to get to some of these properties of finite dimensional norm spaces. Um, the uh, central fact that we're getting to is that all norms are equivalent in finite dimensions. Uh, what the heck does that mean? Some kind of norms being equivalent? Okay, yeah, some kind of isomorphism idea. Uh, what it means is that that the nor if I had two different norms on a finite dimensional space, they'd be within a constant of one another in terms of the actual values. So I can talk about um, different norms on R2, right? Can you, do you remember some different norms on R2? I mean, R2 actually, the R2 is a, officially, when he mentions R2, he means the Euclidean norm, which is the square root of the squares of the coordinates. So, <clears throat> there are some other norms or metrics, right? So, so if I take, what, what he does in order to not call it R2, he has an exercise number, um, Problem 8 in section 2.2, .2 where he, he talks about n tuples <laughs> of, of numbers. It says, okay, I have these different norms on these n tuples of numbers. Okay, if I'm talking about <coughs> pairs of real numbers, then I have different norms on pairs of real numbers. I'm very careful not to say the word R2 because that automatically implies the Euclidean norm. But, okay, you understand. So, on pairs of real numbers, we have, um, uh, let's say, x equals c1, c2. We have several possible norms. One is the Euclidean norm. Norm of x is the square root of the squares 
of the coordinates. And actually, to verify that it is a norm, so satisfies the triangular inequality in particular, you go back to your algebra or whatever, or go back to chapter one. I didn't ask you to do that. Uh, there are some other easier norms to verify the triangular inequality. Another one would be the, um, the one norm, which is x sub 1. This is the two norm if I needed to put a subscript on it, okay, to differentiate. The one norm would be the sum of the absolute values, c1 plus c2. C the infinity norm would be, um, and by the way, this one norm is the Manhattan norm. Uh, we'll see that in a minute if you want. The Manhattan norm is basically um, how much you have to pay the taxi driver, okay, in terms of how many blocks horizontally plus how many blocks vertically you went to get somewhere. Okay. <laughs> no shortcuts uh, in that Manhattan metric. Which, which movie was that? Or which... Shortcuts, you thinking of? Oh, I was just thinking in the Euclidean norm. You could yeah, do yeah, shortcut, right. Yeah, so yeah. as the crow flies or whatever they say. Okay. Okay, infinity norm would be um, x infinity, which is the, the maximum of the two. Okay, now there's kind of a geometry for each of these norms. Let's look at that. Um, we already know the geometry of the Euclidean norm that gives you a circle. In other words, if I set the norm equal to 1, what do I get? So the set of x, the set of x such that the norm of x is equal to 1 in the three, in the three norms. Okay. We have the circle of radius 1. That's sort of a circle of radius 1. <laughs> um, what else? What I have, this this uh, c1 plus c2 in absolute value equal to 1. If I take away the absolute values, that gives, if you think of c1 as x and c2 as y, I know it's not consistent with this notation, but if x plus y equal to 1 gives you a straight line that cuts off the first quadrant of the points 0, 1, 1, 0. So you get, so therefore you'll get, you'll get a diamond shape. Okay? So you can get to any point on the boundary of that diamond with one dollar in Manhattan. I mean, that's the idea. Okay? <laughs> You can go over a certain amount and then up a certain amount. That gives you a fixed number of blocks. Okay? Think about one dollar giving you ten blocks or something. It's doubtful you could get that far. But anyway, <laughs> maybe it's a dollar a block. I don't know what it is. I haven't been to New York in ever. Okay? <laughs> so don't ask me. <laughs> Okay, so that's the that's the. What about the infinity norm? What's what's the um, a square? Yeah. That so that would be this. It would contain the other ones. Okay, that's the square. So this is the case infinity. This is the case of two, and this is the case of one. All right. Okay. So let's have the main lemma that's going to be covering all of this business and then see if I can give uh, one example. So what's the main lemma? Two point four dash one. Let Suppose I have a linearly independent set. In, in a norm space of any dimension. Then there exists 
a constant c, which depends on actually the, the, the collection of vectors that you started with. He doesn't mention that in the text, but I mention it here. That is positive, c greater than zero. All right. I didn't have room to say greater than zero here. Okay, so I put comma. C greater than zero, such that for all scalars alpha one through alpha n, you have that the norm of summation alpha j x j, j goes from one to n, is greater than or equal to c times the sum of the absolute values of the scalars. Uh, did I put C's? I put alphas. So basically what you're saying is you're comparing one norm, the norm of the space, with an L1 norm. Okay, in in finite dimensions, and you're saying you have this. This is always true. That where c again may depend on the actual vectors you choose. All right, that's the lemma. Let's apply it, or well, let's see how it actually pans out in uh, an example. So let's do an example. What I'm going to do is take the situation of pairs of real numbers, and I'm going to take as the norm the infinity norm. Right? Take um, um, pairs of reals, C1, C2, x equals C1, C2, with the norm of x equal to the maximum of the absolute value, C1, C2, as above. Okay, and let's find the largest C that works in this inequality. So my vector space is simply pairs of real numbers, and my, this is my norm, so that's my whole space. And now I'm going to uh, say, well, uh, so in other words, now I'm going to take, and now I'm going to take a basis of that whole space. So my capital X is not going to be a very big space, it's just going to be two-dimensional. But I'm going to take a basis of a full space and verify this. All right, take E1 equals 1, 0. E2 equals 0, 1. That's clearly linearly independent set. As linearly independent set in X. In fact, it generates all of X equals pairs, equals real pairs. OK? Okay. So now what's the C? So I need to, I want to find the largest C that I can do. That's going to be kind of to understand this C. Find the largest C that will work. Because if I can find, uh, that's the, the kind of the meat of it, because I can always, if I can find one C, I can always find a smaller C that works. But I want to find the biggest C that works. in lemma 2, 4, 1. Okay. All right, so let's just do it. What I'm going to do is claim, first, the thing is that you can uh, simplify and assume that the sum of the absolute values of your scalars is equal to 1, because there's a scaling in here. Look, if the sum of the absolute values is something different than 1, call it s. If, if s equals the sum of the absolute values, well, here I'm just talking about two, two things, okay? I might as well just, I'm only going to work with n equals to 2 here. Then, uh, then inequality, then um, put beta j equals alpha j over s. 
then the original inequality for the alphas is equivalent to the inequality for the betas by scaling. Uh, origin, okay, so if I call star, this star, then star is equivalent to uh, beta, I'm working with, okay, in beta equivalent to here, here with n equal to 2. It doesn't matter what n is here, but here I'm just... It's enough to look at this for n equal to 2. You get the idea of the argument. Beta 1 x uh, 1 plus beta 2 x 2 in norm greater than or equal to c times absolute value of beta 1 plus beta 2 equals to c with beta 1 and absolute value plus beta 2 equal to 1. In other words, I only need to check it for all beta 1, beta 2, where the sum of the absolute values is of the beta 1 and beta 2 is equal to 1. So I'm going to get rid of uh, the sum of absolute values by making, by insisting that it's equal to 1. So I need to check that. Okay, so can I do that? with this situation. So this is double star. I'll just call this double star. So that's the first simplification. Just say by scaling, I can look at only on the scalars beta 1 and beta 2 whose sum of the absolute values equal to 1. Well, that was just that diamond, right? So again, I'm comparing L infinity with, uh, with the diamond, okay? L infinity norm with the diamond norm. So what I'm going to do is draw a picture I'm only and this is my uh, beta 1 and my beta 2. I'm going to consider only those betas that sit there. And here's the height 1 here. And I need to find, so C is now going to be, the maximum C will be the minimum of beta 1 e1. Now my x1 is e1 and my beta and my uh, beta 2 e2 in norm. Overall beta 1 plus beta 2 equal to 1. That's the formula. Because again the largest c is going to be the smallest it can be. Right? I can't, uh, that norm gets too small, then it won't be greater than C if C is too big, right? <laughs> okay. So that's going to be the thing. Now, what is the norm of beta 1 E1 plus beta 2 E2? Beta 1 is a scalar. E1 is the vector 1, 0. E2 is the vector 0, 1. So that's simply the uh, minimum over of all the beta 1, beta 2 that lies on this diamond of the max norm. Uh, absolute value of beta 1, absolute value of beta 2. Because that's the infinity norm of that vector. Beta 1 E1 plus beta 2 E2 in this situation is simply equal to the vector beta 1, beta 2. So that means I need to do this min-max thing. What is the minimum of this? So, so I need to basically take the ma think of the maximum equal to a number, like the maximum equal to d. So that would be you're looking at all squares, okay? And you want to find the smallest square that just hits this diamond. Then, yeah. because you want the minimum of all the d's. That's what it says: the minimum over this diamond of all the d's that you all the d sets you might get. So basically, what I'm thinking is a bunch of different squares which corresponds to, uh, you know, there are beta 1, beta 2 on that diamond that, that uh, get L infinity norm equal to D. That's a uh, D. But the smallest D that's going to work is the one that's just got its corners on here, right? That's the smallest D that's going to work. So what I claim is that this is equal to, uh, corresponding to the point 1 half, 1 half.
uh, the minimum, this is equal to one half. Okay. So it's a bit too kind of stomach. You have to sort of stare at it for a while. <laughs> okay. But now, how can I verify that? In the notes, what I, in the type notes, what I do is then I verify that indeed C equals one half does the job. I go back to the argument. I say if C equals one half, that indeed the worst case is if the beta one and beta two are each equal to a half. Because if one of them is bigger than a half, then hey, the norm is bigger than a half. Right? That's the worst case. And if C is bigger than a half, that's no good, because if C is bigger than one half, that I have to take beta one, then I can just take beta one and beta two both equal to a half, and, and the inequality doesn't work anymore. So you kind of go back through and check that C equals a half does work. All right. Questions? All right. So I only got through about a page of these, so I'm going to have to uh, <laughs> look at a little bit more notes too. But the notes too should be available on the uh, website, and so maybe read up that a little bit. So, so we're going to get that uh, uh, all finite dimensional uh, spaces are closed in their super space, okay, in, in the large so all finite dimensional subspaces are closed, and various other things. And it's equivalent of norms. So look at the definition of equivalence of norms. Uh, that'll help a little bit, okay? All right, that'll be it for today. Thank you very much. And all this stuff is online if you want to repeat some.